And that was the seed of the idea? Yeah, I mean, neither of us had thought of that before. I mean, I was busking madly because I was just coming, I felt like I'd uh, just come in to have a chat. I didn't even know there was a commission around the corner, you know. And then suddenly mm. we were motoring. Um, Greatest Show had a much, much more complicated history. And there were three or four different. Um, it, John Nathan Turner had this idea originally. He wanted to do a Doctor Who story set in the long leaped Doctor Who exhibition. <laughs> wow, that's very meta. Uh, yeah, it is a bit meta, isn't it? And he, at the same time, gave us this title, The Greatest Show in the Galaxy. You know, no pressure there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, gradually he went off the idea, thank goodness. And this is why Andrew, Andrew was away at that time, so John was talking to him. And then it became about um, computers and it didn't work, and then it became about a service. So it was a very gradual process. Um, and it's all, you know, because as you go along, you, you discard some ideas, you keep some ideas. Mm. And it's very instinctive, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, yeah, sources are different. Three different stories for me. Uh, full Circle started off very much with the idea of the planet and changing every 40 years in this funny various things for the flora and fauna of the planet. That's where that started. Other ones, I mean, sometimes when they finish, I'm, I'm given a scenario, or I'm given, or I'm, you know, can you, can you do a fourth doctor story with the robots, and the robots are dead? And, that, and my first one, I was told you call it the Sons of Canada. Yes. Um, uh, and other times, you know, I got, I got a story called The Star Men, and so I was walking through the woods in the Drossex and saw these mirror figures, an art installation, these mirror figures, and some of them had stones for them, and they had these little dots in them, so I got the idea. But the only time I've had something like this where I just had the idea of an adversary where there's outlines with stars in them, you know, you can kind of see through them with just outlines. That's what that stuff. Um, a narrative where I usually start with a situation at the start rather than an overall theme, but yeah. it's all mixed up. And then as I write, I tend to have story beats, I think I know what I want to happen and then think of ways of uh, matching them up. Do you find writing for audio more liberating than stage and screen? Uh, yeah, so I, you, you've less to worry about, you, you've less to think about, and it, also there are fewer people it's setting their own creative ideas, which which, is, which isn't bad again because it all flatters the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, in audio, we can go anywhere. We don't have to worry about the budget yeah. travelling somewhere. There's no the, limitations to the imagination. No, the the the, 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 the biggest limitation on a, an audio story is the size of the cast. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that that's that's the main limitation. Apart from that, you can you can go anywhere, and yeah, yeah, you can support, yeah. Uh, open up your imagination just that little bit more. And I suppose audio is, is a really good discipline in writing good dialogue, which is... Well, it's, I, I think sort of radio writing is in some way closer to poetry. What do you think? Because it's all about word and sound. Yes. I mean, yes. of course, you've got, you've got music and stuff, but there is some affinity because the words really have to count and the rhythm they gave to the piece and everything. Yeah. Um, Whereas you know, television has a screen is much more about image than about word. Um, so you sort of, I think you get the, you get the um, uh, the rhythm of lines in your head. Mm. And I, I, I think one of the most sort of humbling things that ever happened to me was I I wrote a paper about the art Elgin Marbles and the story of the Elgin Marbles. And the, the narrator was an Elgin Marble. Um, and, uh, which you could do in radio, why not? Yeah, you, why you, can't you do anything in radio? And we got Paul Schofield to write. Wow. Um, and I, I, the, the, the production assistant came to me and said, Did you see his script? And he said, No. He said, He marked, marked it all out like poetry. Mm. He put the stresses in it. You know, that's actually how he did it. He was like a sort of Nagus. He used words in that way. Mm. Um, and that's why I started thinking about the way in which words work in sound. Yeah. Mm. And conveying story through words yeah. and pushing the plot and the narrative forward. Yeah. It's got a discipline to it. And 
you know, I think it's well known, you have to keep away from just being too descriptive. Yeah. And, um, and that thing, you, you know, you can give a character a line about, oh, look at that monster, it's got two heads, it's got sharp fangs, it's, it's got hair, you know. Or you could just have a character go, oh, look at that, you know. Yeah. yeah. And that is, that is all you maybe need to do, just yeah. let, the, let the listener decide what that thing looks like. Yeah. yeah. Just little signposting to yeah, what yeah yeah because because essentially that's more, yeah yeah this is more writing mm. yeah, you you build a world for the audience mm. it's a help them imagine it mm. and and different worlds at once as well yeah you, you, you don't have this uh, I, I did a play about um the, the wall of the world was a one mm. and the thing that happened was that you could have dialogue the dead were trying to speak to the living but the living couldn't hear them. And it became, you know, so there was a whole somewhere these people were dead, but they had little objects that the living characters were looking at some a book of poetry or something. Yeah. And trying to work out it was and this person was saying, it's mine, and blah blah blah. And it was very powerful, but it's it's in one way it could only work in audio. Yeah. I suppose it, it's a more intimate media as well because it, it's they're talking to you. Well, it, it, my mantra is that radio takes place in your head, not in front of your eyes. Okay. Do you put a lot of yourself into your stories? Like a person experiences. I'm just having a one person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I have um, some unpleasing experiences. I was a, I was, yes, yeah. I was a, a police officer. Yeah. And, uh, as a star corps, as an undercover officer, the first episode tells a story about uh, being undercover in this this gang, and there's a security officer in the gang. They go for dinner, and the guy eyeballs him, and that's something I've experienced. So we used to be sure he's covered with blood. There's a thriller, real called Transference, and there's yeah. a scene in that where they do a drug raid, and one of the officers gets stuck in the door, and somebody in the door, the carving knife, looks that would actually happen to me in uh, 1980. Six. Um, yeah, when I was young, stupid. And uh, he thought, didn't mind with the police. But of course, he's some behind me, show you all Bill, and he thought that. But uh, yeah, so it's little direct things. How did you find coming back to writing after being in the police? Uh, well, I'd always done, I've always been writing for myself over the years. Uh, I was, the nature of the job I did was quite long hours and unpredictable. Yeah. Away from home quite a lot, uh, so uh, yeah, I was kind of writing, writing for myself, and it was. I, I remember when I was approached and asked to write for it. I was really nervous, sitting in that that first script. I was really on edge because um, I hadn't written anything that's going kind to of critically look at quite a long time. But then got the word back from David. It took far too long. <laughs> was that the, uh, that was I, no, that was. Um, uh, that was the invasion of East Space, ah, the Panic Chronicle. Um, David came back and said, oh, we love it, we love it. But just at the point, I was convinced that we were going to say, oh, this is, this is rubbish. But, um, you know, I felt like getting, getting on a bike, get back on a bike. Uh, I mean, I've, I've never been the most confident of people anyway, but maybe that helps my work as well. Mm. But, um, uh, uh, you know, keep knocking out, it seems good. So, what did you do again with personal experience? Um, mostly not consciously. Mm. Okay. You know, yeah, yeah. I, I, of course, who I am and what I've been through affects it, but I don't think myself by and large as an autobiographical writer. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've, I have a thing, if there's a number in a script of mine, it will relate to something in my life. And it might be my daughter's birthday. Uh, okay. Or it will be, there's a quote of my police number, so I was a police number 282, and warrant number 183174. So those numbers are uh, full address numbers. Uh, whenever there's a number, I always get that number from something in my life. It's never random. Uh, uh, do you, um, when you were writing for TV or TV, did you have any uh, other unmade submissions? Because um, the first on challenge was um, yeah, yeah, finished, yeah, yeah, later made it. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was yeah, there was um, actually I was commissioned for the for first season. Uh, I wrote an outline and a scene breakdown and something called Force and Triumvirate. That's the only thing I can remember about that is it's sitting there. 
uh, a sort of all I can remember, and I don't have the material. Uh, I got to Steam Breakout, and then Frost and Talons was the same thing. And that was when I was approached by Eric Saylor and asked to write a St. Talons story. So I did the St. Talons origin story. Uh, but then that again went to Steam Breakout, so I had that to work from when I wrote it uh, for the Big Finish Lost Stories season. But then I had this fellow called Robert Holmes in the St. Talons story instead, <laughs> so that happened. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, and of course there had been submissions before Full Circle as well. A uh, couple of scripts and a couple of outlines. So you still got them? Uh, I have got, yeah, I found a couple, I found them in the loft actually. In fact, one was uh, a story called The Dark Samurai, which I, what was a sci fi story, I, I wrote one of, one of my personal favourite stories that I've written for, because it's a thing called The Barbarians and the Samurai. Perils for the first Doctor event with David Bradley, which is a is now a pure historical set in Japan in the early 19th century. Just I love that period of history and what was going on in Japan at the time. The Dark Samurai was actually half sci-fi, had elements of the barbarians and the, uh, the samurai, but it was a sci-fi story with a connection to the future. Uh, yeah, and there's a story called the Matraki, which I uh, cannibalized for the Brood of Eris. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Sets Doctor's story. So, yeah. Never, never completely.